In 2016, after a seven-year inquiry, the Chilcot report into the UK's role in the Iraq War was released. It concluded that the legal basis for the war was far from satisfactory and that the intelligence regarding weapons of mass destruction had been presented with an undue level of confidence. A polite way of saying they had descended into fantasy. For example, an SIS report from September 2002 stated that Saddam Hussein had been accelerating the production of chemical weapons substances and loading them into a variety of containers, including linked hollow glass spheres. The report was described by the SAS as valuable intelligence and circulated to a restricted group of people, including the private secretary of Chancellor Gordon Brown. There was one small problem. Nerve agents aren't typically stored in spherical glass containers because that would be mental. Thankfully, one recipient noticed that the description of Saddam's new weapons was strikingly similar to the fictional chemical weapon portrayed in the 1996 film, The Rock. The second you don't respect this, it kills you. This claim didn't end up influencing the infamous dossier which made the case for the war, but it does very effectively capture the mood of the British government at the time. They had become so invested in the idea of removing Saddam that they were willing to accept just about anything that strengthened their case. Even if it meant, however briefly, believing in fake bioweapons from a f***ing Nicolas Cage film. That there is a threat from Saddam Hussein and the weapons of mass destruction that he has acquired is not in doubt at all. On a completely unrelated note... Good day to you, you 5.1 million awakening wonders. Russell f***ing Brand. Who is this man? What, what is his thing? Well, just for your peace of mind, I'll start with what he is not. A Putin stooge. At no point in this video am I going to call Russell Brand a Russian state puppet, a Moscow menace, or even a Kremlin gremlin. Because for all his flaws, this lord of spiritual f boys is at the very least categorically opposed to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But... The thing is, people in the West who concretely support Putin are not really the problem. The current polling data shows an overwhelming level of support for Ukrainians amongst Europeans and North Americans. So overwhelming that it makes you wonder, why did the Russian state media even bother to operate in this part of the world? Well, it's because their objective isn't quite the same here as it is at home. Obviously it helps if they can get support from people in the West, but before that, their top priority here is not to win support, but to sow doubt. In 2020, a report from the Oxford Internet Institute outlined the global strategy of the Kremlin-funded outlet, Russia Today. Drawing from anonymous interviews with journalists, the report looks at how RT would exaggerate and give disproportionate levels of attention to Western corruption and division. They would deliberately try to weaken people's trust in Western news outlets and institutions. The point wasn't necessarily to get people over here, but to over here. They might have not managed to get people in the West to support them, but they could at least get Western powers to stop supporting each other. As one journalist said, anything that causes chaos is RT's line. Russia cannot get a majority of Europeans and Americans to support the war. But what they can do is throw enough smoke over the situation that it gets people to doubt their support for Ukraine. Getting people to believe some of their propaganda, or at the very least, a watered-down version of it, is better than nothing. Enter Russell Brand. In summary, Russell Brand's thoughts on the current situation are, the invasion is categorically unjustified, Putin is a tyrant and a war criminal, and the Ukrainian people don't deserve what's happening to them. But, the situation is more complex than the mainstream media is making out, and the West is not without blame. On its face, none of this looks like pro-Russian propaganda. It might even be quite reasonable. But that really depends on what he's using to justify these last two claims. Let's take a look. Part 1. Biological Weapons So just to unpoison the well, so to speak, let's look at what Russia's claim is and how Russell Brand's position is different. Since as early as 2011, the Kremlin have insinuated that Ukraine has been carrying out suspicious biological research with the oversight of the United States. 
Over the years, this has escalated into claims that Ukraine has been developing biological weapons, and with the invasion, they've evolved into, well... The Ukrainian government was literally hosting U.S. bioterrorism and U.S. biological warfare laboratories on its f***ing soil. You're telling me they're not anti-Russian? They're connecting Russian DNA on Ukrainian soil for developing bioweapons. And the Ukrainian government was hosting this. The Ukrainian government hated Russians so much. Now, to give him credit, Russell Brand isn't saying this. What he is saying is, well, that's hard to tell. Russell Brand's video regarding the Biolabs claim is called, So This Is What They've Been Hiding which sounds very exciting. What have they been hiding? Maybe we should take a look. Oi, there are no bio labs in Ukraine. That's a conspiracy theory. There's biological research facilities, but that's completely different. Okay, I'm sorry to interrupt it so early, but just so we're sure there's no confusion, a bio lab and a biological research facility are the same thing. I don't know if this is a misspeak and when he says biolab, he actually means biological weapons lab, but maybe we should carry on. Today we're talking about Ukraine and the ongoing conjecture that there are bio research facilities there. We read your comments, as you know, many of you are like, talk about the bio labs, Russ, talk about the bio labs. Well, there's no confirmation that there are bio labs, but there are biological research facilities, which is entirely different. Right, so he's, um, He's doing the thing again, but we'll just try to ignore that because now what he's saying is just not true. There is no conjecture about whether or not there are biolabs in Ukraine. There are biolabs in Ukraine and they've never been a secret. Not least of all to Russia. That's because the labs in question have been there since the Soviet Union. The labs do contain pathogen strains which can be used to produce bioweapons, but these same pathogens also have legitimate civilian uses. Even anthrax, which we all know for its use as a bioweapon, can also be used to produce vaccines and detection systems. In Kazakhstan in the 1980s, there was a Soviet facility which had been working with pathogens and producing things like vaccines, diagnostic tools, herbicides and medicines. However, this lab was equipped to the point that it could produce 300 metric tons of anthrax in the space of 10 months. And this production capacity was considered far too high for any conceivable civilian use. On top of that, there were fortified concrete bunkers next to the production building where a concentrated slurry of pathogenic microorganisms were sealed into bomblets and then installed into aerial bombs or missile warheads. The point is, you can't just point at a lab working with pathogens and call it a weapons lab. Otherwise, Europe would have quite a lot to answer for right now. And I thought I would just share that so we can compare it to the kind of evidence we're about to deal with. So, back to Ukraine. Since the fall of the Soviet Union, Ukraine has since given up its nuclear weapons and signed itself to the Prevention of Proliferation of Weapons of Mass Destruction. That's a mouthful. Since 2005, the United States entered an agreement with Ukraine which aimed to uphold the Umbrella Agreement as well as provide assistance with risk management and cooperative research. This has involved the United States partially funding these labs, but they have all remained under the control of the Ukrainian government. Once again, this is public information and the heading of the agreement even says pathogens and expertise that could be used in the development of biological weapons. Nothing is being covered up here. In fact, we know it isn't because Russia's own security reports on Ukrainian biolabs have depended entirely on information from the public domain. And we know this because last month, the Russian ambassador to the United Nations made his case for the existence of biological weapons to the Security Council. In his statement, which you can find on the Russian UN website, he spoke about the transfer of more than 140 containers with ectoparasites of bats from a biolab in Kharkiv abroad. We do not know anything about the fate of those dangerous biomaterials and the consequences that may occur once they dissipate, possibly in Europe, in the absence of any international control. In any case, risks are high that they may be stolen for terrorist purposes or to be sold at the black market. 
And the research he's talking about here is from a paper in 2021 called Molecular Screening of Vector-Borne Pathogens in Ectoparasites from Bats in Ukraine. They mention 143 samples of fleas and ticks collected from bats in Kharkiv, so that checks out. The biolab he's talking about is most likely the Institute of Experimental and Clinical Veterinary Medicine, or this scary looking building. And the transfer abroad he's talking about will have been to the Friedrich Loeffler Institute in Germany, given that their name is on the study and two of the researchers were based in Germany. So when he says, we do not know anything about the fate of those dangerous biomaterials, I'm not sure why he thinks that, given that the study was concluded and presented at the annual conference of the German Veterinary Medical Society. In fact, one of the German researchers commented on this statement and said, Rubbish! I know their fate, they're in my freezer. Yes, we did work on ectoparasites and receive samples, but what's been made of it, this bioweapon stuff, is completely crazy. And I will leave it up to the viewers to decide which one of these stories you believe. The point is, the biolabs are not a secret, and apparently, neither is the research that the Russians are presenting in their evidence. The question being raised is whether or not these labs are being used to develop weapons. And to show us what they've been hiding, Russell Brand starts by reading out an article by Glenn Greenwald. Self-anointed fact-checkers in the US corporate press have spent two weeks mocking as disinformation and a false conspiracy theory the claim that Ukraine has biological weapons labs either alone or with US support. They never presented any evidence for their ruling. Well, now there is some evidence from high-ranking officials. A senior diplomat has said there are research facilities that are biological. Once again, we're into that land of semantics we find ourselves in. Well... Yes, we are in the land of semantics, but Russell, that's your fault. Once again, you're treating the existence of biolabs as if it's some kind of revelation, which it is not. And from here on, we're at the point of no return. The problem here is that Russell Brand has managed to get himself stuck in a semantic cobweb of his own making. He thinks the fact checkers have denied the existence of any Ukrainian biolabs. From there, any information about biolabs will look like, well, something they've been hiding. Another nail in the coffin of the lying mainstream media. I can't tell if he's doing this intentionally, but this is a classic technique for conspiracy theorists. The trick is to make an outlandish claim and then use benign information that sounds like that claim and use it as evidence. So someone like Alex Jones can say, they're putting chemicals in the water to turn the frogs gay. People will say that's bullshit, and then someone gets to pull out a study on pesticides that cause male frogs to change gender, and that Jones's claim turned out to be true. Except it didn't turn out to be true, because first, changing gender isn't the same as turning gay, and also, that study came out in 2010, six years before Alex Jones mentioned it. He didn't turn out to be correct, he took information that already existed and told an incorrect version of it. Swap out the gay frogs for bioweapon labs and the pesticide study for regular biolabs and you have the same effect. And if your thumbnail has a picture of mainstream media NPCs stubbornly insisting that Ukraine doesn't have biolabs, which they didn't say, anything that contradicts this will be enough for your audience to feel vindicated. So when we have, say, a video of a US official confirming the existence of biolabs, the contents of which would be dangerous if they fell into enemy hands, Russell gets... kind of excited. Now we can have a look at that with our own little eyes and with our own little minds. Assess, who are you going to believe? The government or your own lying eyes? The mainstream media or your own ability to look at stuff and decide for yourself? Got to be the old government and media, hasn't it? I mean, they never let us down before. I only have a minute left. Let me ask you, um, does Ukraine have chemical or biological weapons? And this is where you say no, and we can carry on with our presumed narrative. Uh Ukraine has uh, biological research facilities. Oh, no, that's not good. Which, in fact, we are now quite concerned Russian troops, Russian forces may be seeking to 
uh, gain control of. What? No! No, no, no! Abort! Abort! So we are working with the Ukrainians on how they can prevent any of those research materials from falling into the hands of uh, Russian forces should they approach. So whatever it is that's in that biological research facility, it warrants some concern. They ain't just in there knocking up nail varnish and conditioner. So this is pretty incredible, isn't it? This is Russell Brand looking at a primary source and smugly being wrong about it. He also apparently can't seem to think of any middle ground between biological weapons labs and labs that produce nail varnish and conditioner, but okay. I find it weird that he does this because he knows full well that a biolab doesn't need to be producing weapons in order for it to be dangerous. And I know that because he mentions it later in the video. The US Embassy in Ukraine publicly boasted of its collaborative work with Ukraine to consolidate and secure pathogens and toxins of security concern and to continue to ensure Ukraine can detect and report outbreaks caused by dangerous pathogens before they pose security or stability threats. What there appears to be, according to the video that you just saw with your own eyes, is American concern that the contents of those research facilities could end up in Russian hands. You just saw that. Why would that be? I do find it a bit suspicious that he's asking this question at all. We know why the contents of those labs are dangerous. The heading of the US-Ukraine agreement in 2005 explicitly says that the labs could be used to create biological weapons. But now that we know why Newland was concerned about these labs falling into Russian hands, where is the concern? Is it unreasonable to worry about the safety risk of an invading army attacking a biolab that works with dangerous pathogens? Apparently not, according to these people. If these labs are merely designed to find a cure for cancer or create safety measures against pathogens, which, by the way, is the sort of thing you should be doing in labs, isn't it? You forget that. What are they doing? Oh, they're just humanising mice. What? Why don't they do something about cancer? No, we've got to get these mice nice and humanised. And also, why would you? Because, oh no, some harmless research might get into the hands of Russians. What does that matter? Doesn't matter. And there, in a nutshell, is the entire problem that Russell Brand and Glenn Greenwald are cataclysmically stupid. Could they not have taken five minutes to look up how dangerous pathogen research can be? How some of them require researchers to wear full body pressurized suits with independent oxygen? And how safety standards like this might be compromised if you get attacked by an invading army? This is also why international oversight of these labs is fairly common. The whole point is that countries can cooperate, share information, and manage risk. The purpose of the 2005 agreement was to ensure that the Ukrainian labs didn't end up being used to create weapons, and so far, it looks like they succeeded. Even at the end of his UN address, the Russian representative said this. Many of you said you were not aware of Ukraine's biological programs, but this does not mean they do not exist. Military research, is a secret venture. Like, okay, I guess the use of completely inoffensive bat research was just filler then? Maybe you were trying to target an audience with some preconceived notions about labs that work with bats? The truth is, the evidence that these labs were being used for nefarious purposes is just as weak now as it was 10 years ago, and videos like this are hardly strengthening their case. The article Russell Brand is reading would have been no less ridiculous if it said something like, You what, lad? Fact checkers deny that Ukraine has nuclear weapons. However, mounting evidence has shown that there are, in fact, nuclear facilities in Ukraine, and that officials were very concerned when these supposedly benign institutions fell under attack from Russian forces. You get the idea. And hopefully you can see how content like this can unambiguously condemn Putin, but still, however accidentally, end up doing his job for him. This video added nothing to the dry pool of evidence that Ukraine is developing bioweapons, and despite its title, it didn't show that anyone was hiding anything. What it did do was present the fact checkers as dishonest, which they were not, imply that the biolabs were a hive of suspicious activity between Ukraine and the US, which they were not, and act as if they had caught a US diplomat spilling the beans about those biolabs, which she did not. Notice that this all plays into the objectives of Russian state media in the Western world. 
The point is not to justify the war, but to confuse people. Ideally, people with very big audiences, like Russell Brand. It's to give the smallest shred of credence to the idea that Putin's actions are understandable and that the invasion of Ukraine wasn't without provocation. If you can start to entertain the idea that the Ukrainians were f***ing about with bioweapons and were doing so with US oversight, what else will you end up believing? Now that Russell Brand thinks he's onto something, he can go on to believe things like this. Newland's bizarre admission that Ukraine has biological research facilities that are dangerous enough to warrant concern that they could fall into Russian hands ironically constituted more decisive evidence of the existence of such programs in Ukraine than what was offered in 2002 and 2003 to corroborate US allegations about Saddam's chemical and biological programs in Iraq. Wow, that's pretty interesting, isn't it? That 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 in itself is a more cohesive and reliable piece of evidence, given that it comes from a high-ranking diplomat, than what mobilised action in Iraq. That's heavy. Heavy, but also not true. In fact, Russia's allegations are strikingly similar to one that was made against Iraq before the war. One of the claims pushed by George Bush and Tony Blair was that they had discovered two trailers in northern Iraq which were being used as mobile germ warfare labs. Three months into the war, an official British investigation found that the trailers were actually being used to produce hydrogen to fill artillery balloons. Unlike the story from the beginning of this video, the Chilcot inquiry found that this had contributed to the pre-conflict judgments of the UK. This isn't more evidence than what was used to invade Iraq. It's the same kind of evidence. The fact that Ukraine has biolabs which could be used to develop weapons has been public knowledge for decades. The claim from Russia is that they are being used to develop weapons. For that, there is currently no evidence, and this video has added nothing to the conversation. But if you're Russell Brand, it definitely looks like it has. But as ridiculous as this example is, it's hardly evidence of Russell being pro-Russian. It is a good example of how the Kremlin succeeds in stunlocking the Western media by turning completely uncontroversial pieces of information into front-page news stories. They didn't manage to convince Russell that Ukraine was developing bioweapons, but they did manage to convince him that something fishy was going on and that Western outlets were lying about it. As far as the so-called information war goes, it's a win for Putin. But you could probably write this off as an honest mistake. If we want to go so far as to call his coverage despicable, we need something a bit more directly dishonest. Part 2. Is the CIA in the room with us now? The next video is called You've Been Lied To About Why Ukraine War Began, and in the description it asks us the question, how did a US-backed, far-right-led revolution in Ukraine help bring us to the situation we find ourselves in today with regard to the Russian invasion? This question contains a few positive statements which are, shall we say, problematic. But before we get into that, let's hear what he has to say. What we really want to understand today is how did this situation really begin? Of course, you could have what is called infinite regress. Oh, because of Stalin. Oh, because of American colonialism. Because of British imperialism. But a very important time in the escalation of this conflict was 2014. And it's that in particular we're going to talk about today. Okay, so this is a reasonable start. Admittedly, I'm not sure how significant British imperialism was for Ukraine, and he probably could have swapped that out for, say, centuries of Ukrainian suppression by the Tsars, but I'm just being pedantic. Starting with 2014 is as good a time as any. It seems to me that when you're talking about the neo-Nazi component, American interventionism, this was a key episode in the situation we find ourselves in today. Now, here is the first red flag, so to speak the American interventionism and the neo-Nazi component. Now, I do have quite a bit to say about the neo-Nazi component, but Russell only really mentions it in passing, like, he doesn't elaborate on it at all, so for the purpose of this video, I'll just focus on American interventionism because that's what he does. 
I like even having it explained to me that there was an intention between America and Europe to create institutions in former Soviet nations. A lot of you have mentioned in the comments below about the Cuban Missile Crisis and how when Russia were willing to put missiles in Cuba, how that very nearly brought about the Third World War and are drawing comparisons between the militarization of Ukraine and other surrounding former Soviet states and that event, how it is in essence, a hostile encroachment upon Russian sovereignty. Well, well, hang on. Did you hear that last phrase? Europe and the US expanding their influence into Ukraine is a hostile encroachment upon Russian sovereignty. Is Russian sovereignty really the thing we should be concerned with, given that the country we're talking about is not Russia? I mean, let's just say hypothetically, it could be shown that US and EU integration was actually perfectly in line with the sovereign wishes of, I don't know, Ukraine. This sentence would look kind of weird, wouldn't it? It would look like the desires of the Ukrainian people were being sidelined to give more credibility to the desires of Russia. For example, the Jacobin article Russell is reading from makes a suspicious choice when they later say, a plurality of the country not crucially an absolute majority, still wanted European integration. The question I'd like to ask here is, why is it crucial that support for EU integration was only a plurality? Well, it isn't. That's just a rule that this author has decided to make up. We're not talking about the democratic mandate to start a war or <laughs> secede from a nation. We're talking about a trade deal one which was by far the more popular option before and during the Maidan protests, and has incidentally also managed to achieve and maintain absolute majority support ever since. But why would they want to downplay the wishes of the Ukrainian people to lean westward? And for that, Russell Brand gives us a bit of a hint. The backdrop to the 2014 coup and annexation cannot be understood without looking at the US strategy to open Ukrainian markets to foreign investors and give control of its economy to giant multinational corporations. What? America? Trying to open up new markets? Hi, how dare you? How could you even? What evidence? When is there previous history of America trying to open up markets to global conglomerates? Oh yeah always, all the time, with every single war there's ever been. And there it is. The classic political philosophy of America bad. This is so f***ing annoying too, because America is bad, dude. And I, as an American, have every right to say it loudly and say it proudly. Disgusting filth, dude. Eurocentrist trash. Okay, now, I agree that America is bad. What I don't believe is the idea that America bad is some kind of magic button you can push in order to explain the geopolitics of every unique nation. Which is exactly what happens in this video. The IMF is funded by and represents Western financial capital and governments and has been at the forefront of efforts to reshape economies around the world for decades. Reshape economies. That's take over sovereign nations. We'd just like to reshape your economy. Well. No, Russell. In this case, reshape economies means reshape economies with the consent of the people living there. If anything, the nation that was trying to undermine sovereignty was Russia. Before the Maidan protests, Ukraine had been playing a kind of economic balancing act with a quarter of their exports going to Russia and another quarter to the EU. This might appear to have been quite a decent compromise between the EU and Russia, but it wasn't working for Ukraine. By 2014, Ukraine's GDP per capita was barely higher than it was in 1990. And one can only wonder why the Ukrainian people would have a desire to lean more towards the West and away from Russia. No idea why they'd want to do that. This is the problem with viewing Western integration in zero-sum terms. And even if it were the case, shouldn't that decision be up to the Ukrainian people anyway? If anything, a far stronger case for economic imperialism could have been made here against Russia. After all, it isn't unusual for Russia to threaten smaller countries with economic sanctions and coerce them into accepting the terms of Putin's Eurasian Customs Union. In fact, a very similar threat was also made to Ukraine. In 2013, they started intensifying customs procedures on imports from Ukraine, and Putin warned that Russia would impose protectionist measures on the country if they signed the EU Association Agreement. 
rather prophetically, a Kremlin aide said, we don't want to use any kind of blackmail. <laughs> That's a good start. And then went on to say that if Ukraine did sign the EU agreement, Russia could no longer guarantee Ukraine's status as a state and could possibly intervene if pro-Russian regions of the country appealed directly to Moscow. But remember, they don't want to use any kind of blackmail. All the same, these threats did little to shake Ukraine's support for EU integration, and the president, Viktor Yanukovych, a staunchly pro-Russian leader, knew it. On Ukrainian Independence Day in August 2013, he gave a speech where he presented a vision of Ukraine as a modern European state. However, in the same speech, he also hedged his bets and hinted towards deepening ties with Russia. In December of that year, the Russian National Wealth Fund – notice we don't hear about them in Brand's video, we're only allowed to talk about the IMF, you see – offered a $15 billion loan to Ukraine in exchange for closing the door on negotiations with the EU. Russia made it clear that the choice was all or nothing. Suddenly, that lack of an absolute majority becomes a bit less crucial, you see. Unsurprisingly, Yanukovych accepted Russia's terms, thus triggering the Euromaidan protests. Or, as Russell puts it, OK, so this dude was starting to snub Western and European interests in favour of Russian interests. Whether you believe that's right or wrong, that's you know up for you to determine and decide while picking through this complex information. Because there's a little wrinkle in this where people were trying to set Ukraine up so that foreign investment opportunities would be presented. Yeah, I suppose that's true. There were people trying to set Ukraine up for foreign investment opportunities. Not least of all, the Ukrainian people themselves. And this is where Russell runs into a bit of a problem. His video makes no mention of economic coercion from Russia's end. All we get is the same familiar script about classic Western imperialism, which would be very valuable if we were talking about Chile or Iran or Iraq or all the other ones. But we're not. We're talking about Ukraine. What Russell Brand is doing here is what I would call left-wing American exceptionalism. It's an underlying assumption that the only ones capable of foreign regime change, destabilization, and predatory economics are the US government, the IMF, and the CIA. Unfortunately, this worldview makes no room for the actions of the Eurasian Customs Union, the Russian National Wealth Fund, or even, at times, the Kremlin itself. And if you start with this baseline assumption, it can lead you to some very problematic conclusions. Especially when you're reading out things like this. The civil war in Yemen and the coup in Bolivia both followed a rejection of IMF terms. Oh, what a coincidence. Only the difference here is that Bolivia's rejection of IMF terms and economic shock therapy was done with a pretty strong democratic mandate. Look at that margin. And Yemen is... It's not f***ing Ukraine! Okay, I'm sorry. Earlier in the article, the author describes the ousting of Yanukovych, who rejected IMF terms, as violent and unconstitutional. And now we're talking about countries that reject IMF terms falling to US-backed coups. What conclusion do you think is going to be drawn here? Now, don't worry. No one in this video is saying that Yanukovych was overthrown by angry American institutions. Yet. But I feel like we should finish this story. As we saw earlier, Ukraine was forced to choose between the EU and the Eurasian Customs Agreement. Yanukovych chose the latter, despite the former being the more popular choice. This triggered the Maidan protests and yes, did end with the unconstitutional ousting of Yanukovych, but it's probably worth saying why this happened. The article does mention that Yanukovych was corrupt and authoritarian, but the extent of his authoritarianism is very hard to exaggerate. He had already triggered the Orange Revolution in 2004, when he was caught engaging in electoral fraud where he very briefly succeeded in stealing an election. And on January the 16th, 2014, in the middle of the Maidan protests, he passed a series of incredibly draconian anti-protest laws, one of which granted amnesty to those who committed crimes against protesters. It should be no surprise then that riots broke out three days after the bill was passed, with the first deaths occurring on January 22nd. 
Yanukovych had given the authorities a license to kill, and by the end of February, over 100 protesters and 13 police officers had died. Any remaining credibility Yanukovych might have had was destroyed. On February 22nd, he fled the country and the Ukrainian parliament, including members of his own party, voted unanimously to remove him from the presidency. But none of this appears in Russell's video. All we have is this one small concession. Because you maybe think that old Yanukovych weren't the world's greatest guy, and the chances are that he probably bloody well wasn't. But then also a reminder that his ousting was violent and unconstitutional, and no relation, of course, Leaders that reject IMF terms get violently and unconstitutionally removed by the US. So from where Russell Brand is standing, this is what we have so far. One, Western governments wanted to integrate the Ukrainian economy. Two, the Ukrainians also wanted this, but just not enough to satisfy the Jacobin writer for some reason. And three, the IMF is involved, and they're known for using predatory loans to influence structural adjustment programs, and countries that reject IMF terms end up having coups and civil wars. That all seems like a sufficient amount of priming, and now we can get into the weird stuff. Weeks before his ouster, an unknown party leaked a phone call between US officials discussing who should and shouldn't be part of the new government and finding ways to seal the deal. After the ouster, a politician the officials designated as the guy even became prime minister. Okay, so there was this insurrection that occurred, whether you agree with it or not, because you maybe think that old Yanukovych weren't the world's greatest guy, and the chances are that he probably bloody well wasn't. The fact was there was Western intervention in the government of Ukraine. So this is the first bit of evidence we have for US interference in Ukrainian democracy. We have a phone call where the politician who was designated, interesting word choice, as the guy ended up becoming prime minister. The transcript for this phone call is available online. They do refer to someone called Yats, short for Yatsenyuk, as the guy, and true enough, he did end up becoming prime minister. What Russell Brand's article doesn't mention is that Yatsenyuk was the leader of the opposition. In other words, the one most likely to win after Yanukovych left. Here he is in the 2012 elections, in a comfortable second place behind the party of Yanukovych. This isn't some total outsider like General Pinochet or Juan Guaido, or the Shah of Iran, Armas, Banzer, Videla. Just reminding you of my left-wing credentials. This is the person who was expected to win. And I invite anyone to look at the transcript themselves because there is nothing in it to suggest this is anything more than two US officials describing their preferences for the new government. Or at least there's as much evidence here of US regime change as there was when Donald Trump designated Boris Johnson as the guy and said Corbyn would be a disaster. In other words, none. But the author has one more piece for Russell to work with. In December 2013, Victoria Newland, Assistant Secretary of the State for European Affairs and longtime regime change advocate, said that the US government had spent $5 billion promoting democracy in Ukraine since 1991. $5 billion promoting democracy. Whose democracy? For who? Like, it's like, oh God, we just gotta help Ukrainian people. Come on, let's promote democracy. Do you get anything out of this? Oh God, I suppose down the line, there could be these political advantages and these economic advantages, but as long as democracy is okay. If you care about democracy so much, do it in your own bloody country. Okay, there are a couple of conclusions you can draw from this. One, that the US spent $5 billion in Ukraine over a period of 23 years in order to instigate a revolution and oust their democratically elected government in 2014, as this Facebook meme and various Russian state media sources boldly suggested. Or two, that the five billion was actually a foreign aid allocation to assist in developing an ex-Soviet country. Which is, after all, something the United States has been doing routinely all over the Eastern Bloc since the fall of the Berlin Wall. But of course, if you draw that second conclusion, there wouldn't be much of a story here, would there? So adding to what we had earlier, we now have that there was a phone call where a US official designated a Ukrainian politician as the guy, and that guy ended up becoming prime minister. 
And that same US official said the US government had spent $5 billion promoting democracy, which belongs in quotation marks for some reason, in Ukraine since 1991. What do you think Russell Brand is going to do with these pieces? So this is a thing that goes on. You can't simply just absorb the crap that flows out of mainstream corporate media. You can't just watch that and go, oh no, Putin's bad, oh no. There's a whole set of agencies dedicated to destabilizing unfriendly regimes and installing regimes that are friendly to American business interests. And this is where I think the word despicable becomes justified. Destabilizing unfriendly regimes and installing regimes that are friendly to business interests. Neither of these things were done in Ukraine by the United States. Destabilization happened when Yanukovych betrayed the wishes of the Ukrainian people and his brutal policing strategy ended up getting over a hundred protesters killed. The regime that replaced him after he fled the country was installed not by the United States, but by the Ukrainian people. But you'll notice how neither of the articles Russell Brand is using made that statement themselves. He arrived at that conclusion on his own. To say that the United States destabilized Yanukovych and installed Yatsenyuk would throw them into the world of conspiracy theory. But Russell Brand doesn't mind that. He just needed to be supplied with the right set of carefully curated facts and he was more than happy to fill in the blanks. He's being duped in real time by his own sources. And the result is that Ukraine only gets to exist as a proxy for the much more pressing and alternative media ruling that America is in fact bad. Whereas the idea that Putin is bad and that the Ukrainian people are in desperate need of support becomes boring mainstream media bullshit. And you can tell Russell feels this way because every time he criticizes Russia, he kind of steps out of character a little bit and it's really obvious. This complex situation in Ukraine, here's what's not complex. Putin's illegal invasion is horrific. Ukrainian people are worthy of support. Any support that could be offered that doesn't escalate the situation and make it worse, I suppose. Would you agree with that? Comments below. But in the aftermath of the overthrow, Russia illegally annexed Crimea from Ukraine. So that was bad. But it would be unfair to say that Russell is completely ambivalent to the Ukrainian people. Sure, he sees their democratic will as nothing more than a blind, sheepish expression of US imperialism, but maybe that's just because he thinks they deserve better. Maybe he knows what's better for them. The sort of ideas that start to appear in my head when I hear that level of complexity is, why would you centralise such a diverse group of interests? Who benefits from having one centralised government? Why are we not having libertarian, anarcho-syndicalist systems of government where communities are made as small as possible? Um, I don't know, Russell. I don't know what the average Ukrainian person thinks about libertarian, anarcho-syndicalist forms of government. Like, why don't you ask them yourself? Like, would that guarantee their safety against a Russian invasion? Like, I, okay, I'm done. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I can't. No, just form libertarian, anarcho-syndicalist government. Like, Jesus, shit. Please remember that even though this is a serious subject, we are permitted to apply a humorous lens to expose the ridiculousness and absurdity of the discourse that surrounds it. I'm certainly not making light of the tragic plight of people directly affected by war. We honour them with truth.